This is a reading of an excerpt from the work The Histories of Alexander by Roman historian Quintus Curtius Rufus. After this, the Macedonians came to the capital town of the Shudraka. Most of the enemy had sought refuge here, though their confidence in its walls was no greater than their confidence in their arms. Alexander was already making a move towards the town when a seer began to issue warnings against the siege, which, he said, the king should po at least postpone since it was predicted that his life was in danger. Alexander looked at Demophon, that was a seer's name, if someone interrupted you like this, said the king, when you were preoccupied with your craft in observing the entrails, I am sure you would consider him as an exasperating nuisance. After Demophon replied, such that such would certainly be the case, Alexander continued, when I have my mind on weighty matters and not on animal intestines, do you think anything could be a greater hindrance to me than a superstitious seer? Waiting only to give his reply, he ordered the ladders to be taken forward and, as others hesitated, scaled the wall. This had a narrow cornice and, on top, in place of the usual crenulated battlements, passage was blocked by a continuous parapet. Thus, the king was hanging, rather than standing, on the parapet using his shield to parry weapons falling all around him, for he was the target of projectiles hurled at long range from all the towers about him. His men were unable to reach him because they were overpowered by the missiles showered on them from above. But finally, shame prevailed over the magnitude of their danger, since they could see that by hanging back, they were delivering their king to the enemy. Their haste, however, actually retarded their aid. While they all tried to scale the wall before their comrades, they overloaded the ladders, which then failed to support them, so that they fell to the ground and robbed the king of his only hope. Now, he stood in total isolation in the face of a huge army. By now, his left arm was weary from swinging around his shield to parry enemy missiles. His friends called to him to jump down to them, and they were standing ready to catch him. At this point, Alexander made an incredible and phenomenal move, which added far more to his reputation for recklessness than to his glorious record. With a wild leap, he flung himself into a city full of his enemies, even though he could barely hope to die in combat without uselessly sacrificing his life, since he could have been overpowered and taken alive before he got up. As it happened, his balance was such that he landed on his feet, and so began to fight from a standing position, and fortune had seen to it that he would not be surrounded. Not far from the wall stood an old tree, whose thickly leaved branches gave the king some cover, as though its purpose had been to provide him protection. Alexander pressed himself against his thick trunk so that he could not be encircled, and then used a shield to parry the weapons being showered on him from in front. For, though he stood alone, being attacked by so many at a long range, no one dared to move on him, and more spears hit the branches than hit his shield. Supporting the king in the fight was, first of all, the widespread fame of his name. Then there was his desperation, providing a keen incentive to gain an honorable death. But the enemy kept pouring onto him, and by now, he had taken a large number of missiles on his shield. His helmet had been shattered by the rocks, and his knees had buckled under the severe and relentless pressure. Accordingly, the Indians standing closest to him rushed at him without due regard or caution. Alexander disposed of the two of them with his sword so that they fell dead at his feet. After that, no one had the courage to come close quarters with him. They kept their distance and hurled spears and arrows at him. Though exposed to all these enemy weapons, Alexander had no difficulty in protecting himself. Down on his knees as he was, till an Indian fired an arrow two cubits long, for the Indians had arrows of this size, as I explained above, which passed right through his cuirass to lodge itself slightly above his right side. When he received the wound, a thick jet of blood shot forth. He dropped his weapons and appeared to be dying. He was so weak that he did not even have the strength to pull out the arrow with his right hand. The man who had inflicted the wound therefore ran up to strip the body, all eager and exultant. Alexander felt him put his hands on his body, and I suppose the indignity of this final insult brought him round. Summoning back his failing spirit, he brought the sword beneath his enemy and plunged it into his unprotected side. Three bodies now lay around the king, and the other Indians kept their distance in bewilderment. Alexander tried to pull himself up on his shield, intending to go down fighting before his last breath left him. He had not the strength left for the effort. 
so he attempted to stand by grasping the overhanging branches with his right hand. Even thus, he could not control his movements. He sank back to his knees, with the gesture of his hand challenging any of the enemy to come and fight. Finally, after dislodging the defenders in another sector of the city, Pukestes appeared, following in the king's steps. When he saw him, Alexander thought Pukestes' arrival meant consolation and death rather than hope of life, and he allowed his exhausted frame to drop on his shield. Immediately afterwards, Timaeus came up, and shortly after him, Leonidas, then Aristonus. The Indians, neglecting everything else when they heard the king was within their walls, also converged swiftly on that spot and proceeded to attack Alexander's defenders. Of these, Timaeus went down with many frontal wounds after a heroic fight. Pukestes too had received three javelin wounds, but even so, he was using his shield to protect his king, not himself. Leonidas received a serious neck wound while trying to check a fierce barbarian charge and fell half dead at the king's feet. By now, Pukestes was also exhausted from his wounds, and they let his shield drop. Alexander's last hope lay in Aristonus, but he, too, was seriously wounded and unable to withstand further the violent pressure of the enemy. Meanwhile, a report reached the Macedonian main body that the king had fallen. What would have dismayed others stirred them to action. Regardless of risk, they smashed through the wall with pickaxes, and bursting into the city where they had made their breach, they cut down the Indians, more of whom who took to flight than dared to engage the enemy. Old men, women, children, none was spared. Anyone the Macedonians encountered they believed responsible for their king's wounds. Mass slaughter of the enemy finally appeased their just rage. According to Clitarchus in Timogenes, Ptolemy took part in the battle. Ptolemy himself, however, certainly from no desire to detract from his own reputation, records that he was not there, since he had been sent away on an expedition. Such was the carelessness of the compilers of the older histories, or an equally reprehensible shortcoming, their gullibility. Alexander was brought back to his tent, where the doctors cut off the shaft of the arrow embedded in his body without moving the arrowhead. They then stripped him naked and observed that the arrow was barbed and could only be removed without serious damage to Alexander if the wound were surgically enlarged. They feared, however, that the operation would be impeded by profuse bleeding, since the arrow buried in his flesh was huge and had apparently penetrated his vital organs. Critobulus was a doctor possessed of extraordinary skill, but in such a critical situation, he was terrified. Fearing to undertake the operation in case an unsuccessful outcome resulted in serious repercussions for himself. Alexander caught sight of him re weeping and fearful, the anxiety almost draining him of color. Why are you waiting? he said to the doctor. What is the moment that you are waiting for? If I have to die, why do you not at least set me free from this agony as soon as possible? Are you afraid of being held responsible for having received an incurable wound? Eventually. His fear passing, or else hidden, Gritobulus started urging Alexander to let himself be held down until he extracted the arrowhead, since even a slight movement of the body would have grave consequences. The king declared that he had no need of people to hold him down, and following instructions, he submitted his body to knife without flinching. So the wound was enlarged and the barbed head extracted. A stream of blood now began to gush forth. Alexander started to lose consciousness, and, as darkness covered his eyes, he lay stretched out as though on the point of death. In vain, they tried to check the bleeding with medications, and shouting and wailing broke out simultaneously among his friends, who believed their king was dead. Finally, the bleeding stopped. Alexander gradually regained consciousness and began to recognize those at his bedside. All through the day and the night that followed, the troops remained in arms crowded around the royal quarters, admitting that the lives of all of them depended on his alone. They refused to leave until they were told that he was taking a short sleep, after which they returned to camp with more sanguine hopes for his recovery.